Uh, really quick, before we get into the message this morning, I uh, forgot to let the <coughs> announcement people know. Um, if you are interested in receiving the text messages, push notifications, emails from the church, out in the foyer, in the lobby, there's a little black thing screwed to the wall with a bunch of forms in there. One of the forms is called the connection form. That connection form, you can put your information, cell phone numbers, your carrier, your email, uh, your addresses, birthdays, whatever. We, we send cards to you for your anniversaries, for your birthdays. Uh, it's a way for us to stay in contact with you. If you have filled one out in the past, but you've changed your cell phone number, you've changed your email, fill out a new one so we can keep in touch with you. Uh, and also on there, there is a list, uh, a spot for you to check off what areas of ministry you might be interested in serving in. So I encourage everybody to go out, fill out a connection form, stick it in the box that's right there below it. We'll uh, get you all signed up for our stuff. Amen. If you have your Bibles, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, I find it kind of amazing. We kind of spoke about this um, a couple of Wednesdays ago. That before every great move of God, before any time God does something, um, there's always a pushback. There's always an assault. There's always an attack. Has anybody experienced that in the past or experiencing it right now? I mean, I guess if there is an attack, if there is an onslaught, then that's a good sign that you're doing something right. Um, I would say to you this morning, do not lose heart. Do not be discouraged. But know that when the world comes against you, that you don't have to fear the world, for Jesus has already overcome the world. And I guess for me, a lot of times, um, my flesh, I'm, I'm tempted in stooping into, you know, the, the I don't know, despair depression, anxiety, or fear. Um, but then I read the word of God, and I am constantly reminded that being in seasons where I feel pressed, where I feel anxiety, where I feel attack, it just means I'm in good company. I'll say it again. I, I guess I'm in good company. Uh, I've always said this, if, if I'm not feeling pushback from the enemy, I have to wonder, am I being effectual for the kingdom? And I want to encourage you this morning that if you are feeling pushback, if you are facing attack, know that God is on your side. And, and, and I don't want you to be misled by fake Christian sayings, like he'll never give you anything. He'll never give you more than you can. You know that's not the truth. That's like one of those made-up quotes that seeker-sensitive preachers like to give. God will never give you more than you can bear. Actually, he loves to crush people. It's actually in the crushing that oil is produced. It's actually in the crushing of the grapes that wine is released. Come on, somebody. The reality is, is while I'm crushed, there's a purpose in my crushing. That's what I take heart in. While I'm, while, what's coming against me is only setting me up for what God has for me. And so, I guess, I would encourage you this morning to be of good cheer and to take heart. So 2 Corinthians chapter 4. You have your Bibles. I'm going to be reading out of the New Living Translation, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 8. And it says this. This is the Apostle Paul 
writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, we are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but not driven to despair. We are hunted down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Through suffering, our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus, but this is so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. Verse 13, but we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist had when he said, I believed in God, so I spoke. We know that God, who raised the Lord Jesus, will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. All of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. That is why we never give up. Though our bodies are dying, our spirits are being renewed every day. For our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they will produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them and will last forever. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things that we cannot see will last forever. God will use the very thing meant to destroy you to develop you. God will use the very thing that was meant to destroy you to develop you. And I'm in a season where I'm in my soulish realm, torn. You ever been torn in your soul? You're excited for things that are coming, but it's just constantly attack after attack after attack, and you're just like, God, Hey, remember me? It'd be nice if this stuff could let up a little bit. Anybody ever been there? Am I the only one? And I'm encouraged by this apostle named Paul who said, hey, listen, if you're doing what God's called you to do, you're going to live a life in the face of this stuff. But while you face it, understand this. We have the victory because of Jesus Christ. And though we suffer persecution, though things come against us, though there are weapons formed against us, we declare that they shall not prosper. While the enemy may want to come in, though he might sneak his way in, though he might find an avenue, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against the enemy. Every wile, every scheme, every plan, every word of the enemy shall fall short, and the word of the Lord shall be accomplished. His word is yes, and it is amen. If God said it, He's going to do it. You don't have to worry about it. And if God's allowing this thing in your life, then he's going to use what the devil meant to destroy you with to develop something in you. So that way, when the next season comes, you won't be crushed under the weight of the glory that's coming. But God has built up something in you that you can continue to walk out and live under what God has. I, uh, I used to be active, more active in the gym and stuff, man. As I get older, my body says no. My mind's like, yes, starting Monday. On Monday, I'm going to do this. It doesn't matter even if it's Tuesday. If you screw up, you got to wait till next Monday. I mean, you can't can't start on a Wednesday. I mean, that's just silliness. So, uh, but I remember um, one.
one of the, the things uh, used to be called a negative. And, and I used to do them a lot when I worked chest for bench. And what negatives were, it was more weight than you could push. And you would lower the weight really, really, really slow. And it's because in the negative is when the muscle tissue starts to rip. And then you have somebody who spots you, it helps lift you up. And then you bring it down really, really, really slow. And what's happening is your muscle tissue is tearing, but it's when it heals that it heals bigger and stronger. And though the weight seemed like it was crushing, it was that weight that was crushing that was actually developing strength. I could have done that with, you know, the, 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 the plastic-coated weights that, you know, the kids work out with. But that wouldn't have developed anything. I would have made myself feel good because look how many reps I can do. But there's no growth that comes out of comfort. Coming into your calling means coming out of your comfort zone. And when God is getting ready to grow us and take us to another season, has anybody ever realized that the transitionary period is crazy and it's uncomfortable and it's chaotic and it seems like everything is falling apart and you're questioning everything? Come on. And you don't know which way is up and which way is down. You don't know your left from your right. And you're like, God, I'm barely hanging on here. And God says, this is the season where I'm going to develop things in you. And sometimes I've got to take you outside of your understanding. Outside of what you can handle or manage on your own. Sometimes i got to throw you into the deep so you fully rely on me. And you stop relying on your gifts and your set of skills and your way out of things. Come on. How many know that Like my, at least my default reaction when I'm getting in a season where things seem chaotic, I try to figure out how can I fix this. And there are some times I try to fix it and things seem right until they're not. And it's like, you know, putting a Band-Aid on a cut on an artery. You know what I mean? Like, I temporarily might have fixed one of the symptoms of a greater issue. But God was actually trying to take me to and through something. Come on, somebody. And it was in that process that I missed something. And I love what Paul says. Paul says this. Yes, we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. hey oh. Jesus didn't call you to live your best life now. Jesus didn't write a life to give you 10 keys to a successful marriage and business. He said, if you're going to follow me, it's going to be a life unto death. It's going to be a life where you have to give up your wants, your needs, your desires, your goals. Come on. Your emotions, your feelings, your right to offense, your right to bitterness. You got to give all that stuff up. You got to follow me. And whether this death means literal persecution or crucifying of the flesh, either way, following me means it's a life sentence of death. But look what he says. We die so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our bodies. So I'm 37 years old. And for the majority of my life, I've made my own decisions, created my own ways, came up with my own methods. And you know what I've done? Screwed up my life. And Jesus didn't die to improve Michael. Salvation isn't about you 2.0 or a better you or an improved you. It's about a dead you. And it's no longer you who live, but it's Christ who lives in you. I couldn't live this life. When I tried to live this life, I screwed it up. Paul is saying the reason things come against us is so that way Jesus can live through us. 
let me help break you out of some sort of condemnation and guilt. You will screw up your life. You will make mistakes. You will fail. You will fall. That is inevitable for human beings. But the Christ in me is my hope of glory. And it's him living in and through me that is my hope. Come on, somebody. That's my testimony. I couldn't fix myself. Only Jesus could. I couldn't improve my situation. Only Jesus could. I can't save Olean. Only Jesus can. And when we understand, like Paul says, when we live in the face of death, it results in eternal life for others. God won't always take you out of your struggle, but he'll always be with you in it. And we have to understand that as we walk through some of these things, like David said in Psalms, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. For you are with me. And Lord, I understand that as I walk through these things and as my soulish nature is tempted to fall into despair, as long as you're with me, I can tell my soul to shut up. And I can choose to live in reaction to what God is doing. Actually, let me say it this way. I'd rather live in response to the Father than in reaction to the devil. I choose to live in response to the Father than in reaction to my circumstances or situations. I choose to live in reaction to the Father despite all the hell that is breaking out around me. Despite the attack, despite the persecution, despite the lies, despite the rumors, I live in response of the Father. And I don't go to the left or to the right. I don't become weary. I don't choose to give up what I want the most for what I want right now. I choose to stay the course because Father, if He's allowing it, He's going to use it. And if He uses it, it's going to be for my good. See, this is what we got to get. Listen, everybody remembers the saying, how many grew up in the church? How many were at least in the church during the 70s and 80s? Some of y'all are like, I wasn't even born. We used to have a saying back in the day, God is good, and all the time, God is good. If it's God, it's good. If it is God, it is good. It may not be my understanding of good, my perception of good. It's kind of like those negatives, it hurts right now. But in a couple of days when I swole, it's good. When your chest starts, you get what I'm saying? How many know that salads are not good? Salads with a lot of dressing and feta cheese and sliced almonds and apricots, that's good. But lettuce in and of itself, I mean, it's rabbit food. I mean, I got half my teeth are canines for a reason. You know what I'm saying? Like. But how many know, like, eating right may not be good in the moment, but in the end, it's super beneficial for my body. Anybody ever, like, go from eating right to not eating right, and you're like, oh, I'm so happy I'm eating a Twinkie. Anybody realize Twinkies are not as good as you remember them to be? Like, they are much better in the mind than they are in the mouth. But then you go from eating, like, healthy to eating garbage, and you know, in the moment you're like all happy, and then you know what happens. Everybody here knows what happens. Your stomach starts to go, blah, 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 and you pay for it, and everybody in your house <laughs> pays for it. And your septic system pays for it. See, what, what's beneficial now doesn't benefit me later. 
Paul says this, so we don't look at the troubles we can see now, rather we fix our eyes on the things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone. But the things we cannot see will be eternal. So let me give you the three quick points that Paul encourages the people in the church of Corinth with in his second letter here. We're going to start in verse 13. I'm going to give you three quick keys of how you get through this season. I was going to say something, but I got to stay safe. All right. Verse 13 says, but we continue to preach because we have the same kind of faith that the psalmist says when he said, I believe in God, so I spoke. That's number one. The reason we keep going is because we believe in God. You don't need a prophetic word. You don't need an impartation. You don't need somebody to sprinkle fairy dust on you. You don't need to be in the right frame of mind. Your emotions don't. You simply do because you believe in God. When I believe in God, I will speak. Meaning, if I believe in God, I'll do what he's asked me to do. Simply because he's God. Like, I think that's the first point whenever we're going through hell. When we're facing stuff, we got to understand he's God. And he's got me in his hands. And he'll never leave me, nor will he ever forsake me. And if he's allowing it, he's going to cause what the enemy meant for evil and turn it around for my good. He's God. And I believe he's God. So if I believe he's God, then I'm going to do what he said. Even if that means standing before a crowd of people and them saying, if you preach in the name of Jesus, like they did to Peter, we'll kill you. Or like when they said to Jesus, hey, listen, why don't you just deny all these accusations and I can spare your life. And Jesus said, my life is not yours to spare. Y'all got to understand something, honey. The, the power of life and death is in the Father's hands. And, and I ain't going to eternity until he says it's time. So you can bring all the accusations. You can, you can condemn me. You can say whatever you want. But until the Father says I'm done. See, I believe in God. And I believe he's God all by himself. Which means he don't need my help. How many are thankful this morning God doesn't need your help? It's kind of like I love in the book of Job when, you know, Job's complaining to God. And normally, you know, like a lot of times you see people complain. And then God, like God shoots back. I love it. That's the apostolic side of the father. Like, shut up and listen to me. Like, this is the Robert's Learden anointing, you know, just shut up and die. Like, like what, what, why do I want to die, Robert? Anyway. The father shoots back, and I love what he says, like, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? Like, wh were you there when I stretched out the waters and I told them you couldn't go pay? Were you there when I put the birds in, in the sky and the fish? Like, were you there? Did, did I come to you for a suggestion of what color should I make the sky, Michael? He's God. And if I'm in this thing, he's going to use it for all of our benefit, not just mine. I, I love the, the, the verse that says, you know, that God will cause what the enemy meant for evil and turn around for our good. And that's out of Joseph, what Joseph was saying to his brothers. And, and you know, we, we, we love those scriptures and they're true. But how many know that when God turns something around, it's not just for your benefit, but it's for the corporate benefit of all those. Remember what Peter said, uh, what Paul says here in verse 12. So we live in the face of death, but this has resulted in eternal life for you. Like it's not just like my benefit. I'm not just going through this so I get my bonus or I get my blessing or I get my healing. I'm going through this so we can all benefit. If, if What if your obedience could bring your neighbor's healing? What if your obedience could bring your spouse's salvation? Like what if you go through hell not to get out on the other side and get your treasure, but so that way your kids will never have to go through what you went through. I believe in God, so I do. The second thing that encourages Paul 
to continue going on is found in verse 14. It says, we know that God who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and present us to himself together with you. So what Paul is saying is this, even if they kill us, I know this guy who can resurrect us. Y'all ain't heard me. Like, what's the worst they can do to you? Just imagine the worst thing somebody can do to you. God can undo it. Think about it. Whatever they can do to you, God can undo and then use what they did for his glory and promotion. Somebody's not hearing it this morning. But you don't understand. Like, what if they kill me? Like, you know, there are, there are people right now, like in Haiti. There are Christian groups in Haiti right now. Uh, anybody know what's going on in Haiti? Uh, gas prices are surging and people are rioting on the streets. And a lot of Christians are, are under, um, uh, like, like, like a bullseye. They're looking for Christians to take as prisoners to use as negotiation tools to help lower gas prices. A little stupid, but like, yeah, that, yeah just kidnapping me is going to help you pay for cheaper gas. But even if they take my life, if God doesn't resurrect me, God will send two in my place. It's the blood of the martyrs, right? How many know that the blood of the martyrs multiplies? For every one that they take, God sends two in their place. Come on. And every, when you take, that's just the way it is. But even if they do take my life, guess what? The power of life and death is in your tongue. God, Jesus said this, go heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers. We have the power to speak into dead situations. The enemy might have prematurely killed some things in your life during this season. And God is saying, speak life into those things. Son of man, do you believe that these bones can live? If so, then prophesy over them. Don't stare at them and hope that God comes through. That's what we do for a lot of our situations. I'm guilty of this. How many has a prophetic word over their life that you're waiting for God to finish to do it? How many? Raise your hand if that's you. There's a prophetic word that has been spoken. You're waiting for God to. You know what the Holy Spirit kind of rebuked me so kindly about? God did his part by giving me the word. The rest of that word is completely up to my obedience. Now, I can delay or prolong walking into the promise by being disobedient or obedient. Come on. Let's choose obedience and get into this promised land a little faster. Let's do what we got to do and stop going around this mountain a few times. And God is looking for a bride who's not just going to be like, well, you know, hubby will take care of it when he gets here. He's looking for a bride who wears combat boots and has gardening gloves and is not afraid to get her hands dirty. God is looking for a church who's willing to go into the deepest, darkest pits of hell and drag and say, no, 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 life, 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 life. He's not waiting for a church who's going to say, oh, one day uh, the, the addicts and the prostitutes will flood our church. What if the church went and flooded the drug addicts and the prostitutes? Like he's looking for a people who are willing to go out and reach one for his kingdom and put into action because we know a God who can resurrect dead situations. And I might be walking walking into a place that looks like it's full of death, but I have life in me. And what I release from me will revive what's around me. And when I walk into a situation that seems impossible, that seems lost, that seems dead, I serve a God of the impossible. I serve a God who seeks and saves that which is lost. I serve a God who shows up and shows off. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to worry. I don't have to say, well, you know, I don't have enough education, or I don't have enough knowledge, or I don't have enough experience. You have. 
the Holy Spirit living on the inside of you. The same creative force that spoke the universe into existence resides on the inside of you. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. So when you're going through something, maybe your reputation is being murdered. Speak life into it. Maybe there's financial attack coming against you. Speak life into it. Maybe your mind is under attack. Speak life to it. I dare you, do not engage the flesh. <laughs> Resist the temptation to gossip and complain and feel bad for yourself and speak life over that thing. Speak life over that thing. I'm not saying that you, like, you become naive and you ignore reality. But there's a difference between recognizing what's going on and speaking life into it and then coming into fellowship with that thing. And the third thing he says is found in verse 15. All this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving. And God will receive more and more glory. Look what he says in verse 16. And this is why we never give up. We don't give up. Because what we do isn't for our benefit. It's so that way God will get more and more glory. I'm so glad I have a couple of people who said amen. amen. That I'm not walking through my hell just so that way I can get my blessing on the other side. Even if I get nothing out of this, I will continue doing what I do so that way God gets more and more glory. It kind of reminds me of the scripture that says this, you have not because you ask not, and you have not even when you ask because you ask with the wrong motives or intention or condition of the heart. Sometimes we're saying all the right things for all the wrong reasons. And we're claiming and declaring and prophesying and releasing, but we're only doing that so we get our next thing. And then what happens? God is so good. He gives us it. And then you know what happens? We go right back to the same spot we were in before until we need something else. And then we get all super spiritual again and we declare and we decree, hey! <laughs> what if you declared and decree even when everything was all right, but you're declaring and decreeing and prophesying and doing just so God gets glory? Like, you know that you don't need a word of knowledge for somebody in a wheelchair? <laughs> you, you, you don't need a prophetic word for somebody who has a cast on. Just go lay hands. Even, even if you get nothing out of it, we're doing it so God gets the glory. Even if they never ask what's your name or they send you an unexpected check in the mail. I've had people, like you've released words over them, and they bless you. And that's great. But I don't prophesy for blessing. It was a gift freely given, so therefore I freely. Like, nothing irks me more than when people charge for the gift. I'm not saying that their gift isn't good or accurate. I'm just saying it's not the right spirit. Even demons can prophesy. Even the devil can heal. Freely given, freely release. Now, what happens is we get in these ruts because we're going back to step one. Remember, like, I do because I believe in God, right? I believe in God, so I speak. Well, I do. Um, so when we miss point number one, when we forget he's God, so therefore if he's God, then I will follow. So everybody loves Jesus as their Savior. But nobody wants him as their Lord. I mean, everybody wants Jesus to bail them out of their problems, but nobody wants to obey him in the first place to keep him out of their problems. And if we lived as Jesus as Lord more often, we wouldn't need him as Savior so much. 
Because if we did what he told us to do, we wouldn't find ourselves in the stupidity we find ourselves in half the time. Anyway, that's another put in your back pocket for later. Munch on it after lunch. It's dessert. But he's God, and that means he gets to tell me what to do. So that's point number one. But what happens, let's be honest, right? So we fall out of that. How many are guilty? I'm guilty. I'm raising two hands and a foot. If I could raise my other foot, I would, but then I'd fall on the ground and break my phone in my back pocket, and I'd be mad. So then sin, and then I have to repent in front of you, and it would just be a whole big ordeal. So, um, so we, we miss point number one. We, we reject the fact that he's God. He's in charge. He has the right to tell us what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. And we don't have the option to say no. Tell that to a 2018 American. <laughs> you don't have any rights. What do you mean? Don't tread on my rights. No, as a Christian, we, as an American, you got rights. Bless the Lord. I thank God for this country. I've traveled the world, and every time I come back to America, I thank God I'm an American. I thank God. I love this nation, and I love uh, what it stands for. Uh, but he's God, and in his kingdom, he reigns. It's not a democracy. It's a theocracy. He is totally supreme. He doesn't take my advice. He doesn't take my counsel. He's God and God all by himself. When I slip out of that, when I slip out of the understanding he's God, I miss point number two, which means when, when I'm living outside of God's alignment, I have no power. I have words but no authority. So I can speak to things, but nothing happens. You ever see people that just yell at somebody who's demon-possessed for hours, and that thing ain't coming out? Like, you getting louder ain't going to scare that demon out of him. Scare everybody else. But not that demon. And I, I, I could imagine the demon's like, Paul, I know. Jesus, I know. But who are you? See, because when I come outside of the alignment of he's God, I lose all authority. Because I have no authority in and of myself. All my authority comes from him. The moment I step outside of his grace, outside of his authority, I'm powerless. And so I can't speak life. How many people have been trying to, I've, I know Christians who've been speaking life. And I'm going to conquer this thing and still struggling with the same issues for 20 years. Right? And then when I fall out of that. So now here I am, I'm running around, I'm yelling and I'm screaming and I'm getting worked up. I'm trying to tear down principalities of regions, but I can't conquer the spirit of Ben and Jerry's in my freezer. <laughs> How many of the self-control is a fruit of the Holy Spirit? So, so, like, I fall out of that authority, therefore I fall out of alignment. And when that happens, I cannot work in phase number three. What's phase number three? Giving glory to God. See, what happens when I'm striving, when I'm working, when I'm toiling, it's glory for myself. Look what I do. I'm satisfying my need to have to work. I'm a busybody. You can ask my wife. If I have five minutes of downtime, I freak out. Unless I'm streaming, like, like if when Stranger Things comes back out, season three, like, I'll straight up take, like, how many ever hours I need to just stream through it. But then I'll feel guilty for sitting down and streaming Stranger Things. Like, I just wasted all that time. It's just the way I am. I got to be busy. Gina will tell you, half the time when I come to the office, honey, I'm going to go and study. She's like, Michael, don't start cleaning out the office. Don't start doing this. Don't. So, like, yesterday, I told her, honey, I'm, I'm going to have to study. For a little bit. She sends me a text message with the picture. I, I, I weeded all the weeds out from the, the parking lot, you know, the grass that was growing between the parking lot and the sidewalk. And then I was sitting there driving around with Roundup, uh, going out the car, spraying <laughs> Roundup. Or, and she sent me a picture. She said, I thought you were studying. <laughs> oh, no, no, it wasn't Gina. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It wasn't Gina. Who was it? Gina wasn't home. It was somebody. Oh, gosh. Now I'm going to have to look at my phone. Oh, yeah, it might have been Pastor Ryan. He's like, I thought you said you were studying. And I'm like, uh, I was all studying in my mind. But what happens is we get busy working, striving, toiling, thinking we're advancing the kingdom, but we're satisfying the flesh. 
And the reason we have to satisfy in the flesh instead of giving God glory is because we're, we have no authority, so our words don't carry much, so we think we have to move things with our hands instead of our words. And the reason we have to move things with our hands instead of our words is because we've come out of alignment of the authority of who God is. Come on, somebody. And once we've come out of that alignment, then we fall right back into this cycle where it's a constant, I'm trying to become something and I'm trying to do something so I can gain this identity and do this and do that and my words are powerless and I'm stuck in this cycle and then what I do is I find people like myself to help solidify my thoughts and it all stems back to coming under the fact that he's God and when I'm going through hell I don't like I love y'all but when I'm going through my storms the person I really need is him like Gina you know me, like me and Gina, close. She's my best friend. But before I go to her, I go to him. Sister Lisa is one of our closest intercessors. And there are times you have to get some people in agreement around you and get the prayer warriors warring. But before I go to the intercessors, I go to him because he's God. And he will cause what the enemy means to be done. And then all of a sudden I find myself in alignment. And man, once things are aligned, authority is flowing. And now I can look at my situation and be like, ah, you know what? I was really overwhelmed by you yesterday. But now I see God. And he's way bigger than See, that's how Paul winds up this thing. If you could bring up verses, what is it, 14, 15, 16? 16. Bring up 16. Maybe 17. I don't know. Uh, maybe 18. <laughs> there. So we don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on the things that cannot be seen for the things that we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. So I, gotta, I take my eyes off of my problems. Now, I am not advocating don't do your laundry or your dishes or feed your kids or something like that. Like, don't ignore the problem, but just don't focus on it. Set your eyes on God. Because maybe your miracle is hidden in the very thing you're overlooking. See, I had that written down. What if your miracle was hidden in the thing that you're overlooking and the fact that you're so focused on your problem, you can't see your miracle because your miracle isn't found in your problem. Your miracle is found in your God. And as you focus on him, I start to understand this. I can't control everything that comes into my life but I, I can control what I focus on. I can focus on what I dwell on. And as I choose to think about the things that are above us, I set my eyes on those things. I understand that the blessing ahead of me always outweighs the battle behind me. Always. So I could be going like Paul. I could agree with everything he says here in verses 18 through 14 when he talks about I'm pressed and I'm crushed, you know, I'm, persecuted right now. Like, I can agree with all those things. I can say yes and amen to this page. Anybody else ever been living 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 18? Like, yeah, yeah, I've been pressed and I've been, I've been persecuted, but I'm not a bit. Like, all that is worth it because I'm going somewhere. See, if I was going nowhere, I, I would want to give up. But the blessing ahead of me it's much greater than the battle behind me. And I refuse to let this battle take me out. I refuse to let this battle have authority in my life. Come on, have access to my mind. Come on, to, 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 to steal my thoughts. Anybody, I've been guilty of it. Anybody ever been in a moment you're going through something and you realize two-thirds of your day, you've just been thinking on that thing and it's been occupying your mind. And I'm not, this is not like a guilt. Like, this is just... I'm just confessing what I do. Anybody ever been there? Like, 
Man, and then, and then, and then, like, you talk to somebody really spiritual. And you're like, oh, man, I'm just going to there. I'm doing this. And they're like, well, you, you sure are focusing a whole lot on your thing. Shut up. <laughs> it's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> I wanted you to be like, oh, poor baby, you know. But, like, sometimes we just got to get our eyes off of that stuff. It's so tempting. All sin falls into the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. We're so tempted to look at things we shouldn't. And I'm not talking about pornography or another person. I'm talking about situations and circumstances and things that come to rob your thoughts, steal your gaze. How many know that he, he, he wants us to have dove's eyes? He says that you are beautiful to me because you have dove's eyes. Like, I'm closing with this. Oh, great. Pastor Scott's up there. Uh, um, you, you have dove's eyes. And I'm like, have you ever seen dove's eyes? I, I Googled a picture of dove's eyes. They're pretty basic. They look like a pigeon. <laughs> I'm thinking, like, that's not something I would think that God would say is a beautiful attribute. But do you know why he loves dove's eyes? Doves have no peripheral vision. They can only see one thing at a time. So whatever they're focusing on is what they're focusing on. Which is why the Holy Spirit descended upon Jesus like a dove. Because you know what consumed the Father's heart? His Son. And so sometimes I got to walk into my situation and be, instead of being like, squirrel, 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 squirrel. I got to have dove's eyes. And say, God, I'm, I'm choosing to focus on you. I, 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 I'm going through a present trouble. But you are my help in my very present trouble. You are the strong tower the righteous run into. I got to encourage myself in the Lord sometimes. Take my eyes off of everything that's around me. I'll close with this statement. How many remember Noah? Remember the, the prophet Elisha? He was the man who followed after the prophet Elijah. And one day Elisha was camping hanging out with his servant. And everybody remembers the story. They, they were coming against the prophets of God. And they come out of the tent, and the pro I think the servant was making coffee, going out to boil some water, because Hebrews, you know, they're Jews, they're Hebrews. Anyway, um, he is going to boil water, get the coffee ready, and he looks out, and all the armies are around him. And he runs back. love the prophet's response. Oh Lord, open the eyes of my servant that he may see that there are more for us than there are against us. And when his servant went outside of the tent, there were armies upon armies upon armies of angels encircling the and I think so many times we're setting our eyes, like Paul says, on things that are now, that are fleeting, that are passing, that are temporary. And we've lost perspective of eternity. And we've lost the bigger picture in all of this. And even if this thing is coming against me in comparison to God, I mean, if he be for me, then who can be against me? I mean... They can send the armies of the world against me, but that's nothing. One snap of God's finger. Come on. One thought in his mind. I'm not demeaning or diminishing your present trouble. I'm just trying to glorify the excellence and majesty of our God above it. I just want you to understand. I'm not saying the pain in your body is just because you have a lack of faith. Get more faith and you'll be healed. I'm not diminishing that thing that's going on in your body, but I know a God who's a healer. And it's his will that you be healed. I'm not diminishing the fact that maybe finances are tight right now and times are tough and you're barely making it 
testify, but, but I know the God, Jehovah Jireh, who's our provider. He owns a cattle on a thousand hill. He also owns the thousand hill that the cattle are on. Like everything in this earth belongs to him. And you might be going, I'm not going to diminish the fears and the thoughts and the anxiety and the stress and the, the, the worries that are in your mind. I'm not belittling them. I'm not trying to lessen them, but I'm trying to tell you that God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power of love and a sound mind. So what we need to start to do is we need to start de-promoting our stuff and exalting and lifting up our God as He be lifted up. May He be a banner over you. Understand this. Whatever you're facing this morning, God has already made a way out. I prophesy to you, there's a ram caught in the thicket. No matter what you're facing this morning, God has already made a way out. Remember when Adam and Eve, they sinned? Do you know that he slayed the lamb before the foundation of the which means God made the way through the lamb even before he created the earth and the people that were in it that were going to sin and need the lamb in the first place. God always makes a way out. He always has an exit plan. God always has an escape route. Come on, somebody. God always has your best in mind. Always. So let's give it to him this morning. So how many could honestly say, yeah, I'm going through some troubles? I have some present troubles. So Father, I ask this morning that for those who have their hands and their hearts lifted, God, that they and their spirits would start to say the very words as Paul said, that starts off all with the fact and the understanding of I believe in you. I believe in every, everything you say you are. You are my healer, my protector, my provider, my strong tower justification you are my righteousness you are my salvation so I believe in you and I put my trust and my hope in you not my 401k not my bank account not my experience I put my trust and hope in you and Lord as I do that help me to live out the life you've called me to live not in reaction to the enemy or to my problems but in response to you, to who you are. And Lord, as that happens, and as I live this life, and as I do, and as I, as, as I serve you, I do it for your glory. Not for self-promotion, not for gain, not for stuff, but I do it for you. So God, we love you. I ask, Lord, that your perfect love would cast out fear right now in the name of Jesus. That peace that transcends all understanding would cover every mind in the name of Jesus. I speak to every uh, fear and anxiety that have been keeping people up in the middle of the night. Lack of sleep. I break that off in the name of Jesus. I declare that stress, anxiety, fear shall no longer have a place in your mind. Lord, I ask that their ear and their thoughts would become deaf and mute to the words and the lies of their soul and the enemy that they would hear your word and your word alone. Father, I ask that they would surround themselves with your word, that they would engulf their minds in your word, that they would renew their minds daily with the reading of the word, Lord, that they would increase a faith by hearing the word. Father, we, we ask right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, for every mind that is troubled, that peace would rest upon them right now. Father, I declare healing in the house. I speak to elbows. I, I speak to shoulders and backs right now to all joints, ligaments, tissues, tendons, nerves. I speak from the top of your head to the soles of your feet. And I declare that by his stripes, you have been healed in the name of of Jesus. It's not by your works. It's not by your efforts. It's by the blood of Jesus and the blood of Jesus alone. I speak to every financial issue, to the canker worm, to the moth, and to the thief that comes to destroy, to, to take away. Lord, I, I, I pray a, a divine protection for those who are putting you first, Lord. I pray, Lord, that, that Lord, as you said, that you would rebuke the devourer on their behalf. Lord, I pray for blessing, not just for them, so, but that they could be a blessing 
in Jesus' name. Father, I pray for wayward children that they would come home to every prodigal, that they would come to their senses and come back to their father's house. For every estranged spouse, to every, uh, every marriage that is uh, suffering right now, Lord, I speak, Lord, that what you have joined together, let no man try to separate. Lord, I pray that your love would, would, would bind their hearts and their minds and the two would become one flesh. Let offenses and hurts and wounds be buried and forgiven in Jesus' name. I feel like there's, um, uh, there's somebody in this room um, in this morning. Uh, there's an issue with a daughter. Um, uh, there's a relational tear with your daughter. Um, and you've been trying to make it right, but there's just, just been so much hurt from the past. So many things done wrong on both sides that it seems like it's an impossible bridge to create. Like there's no forgiveness or restoration anymore. And, and I almost like feel like your daughter has said, like, I want nothing to do with that anymore. We're done. We're just finished. But I want you to know that it's not over till God says it's over. And you know that he's given us the ministry of reconciliation. And like part of our purpose is to reconcile hearts to one another. And I would just speak to you this morning that I prophesied to your relationship with your daughter. I say what the enemy meant for evil. God is turning around. Lord, that by your spirit you administer to her daughter, to their daughter right now. Heal wounds, scars, hurts, abuses, neglect. Restore right now in the name of Jesus. Everything that the canker worm and the moth and the thief have destroyed and the lies and the rumors and the separation and division that has come in that household, I speak over you that you and your household shall be saved. You and your household shall be saved. You shall be one under the banner of Jesus Christ. And Lord, I thank you that even now by your spirit, you're ministering to their daughter. Uh, Lord, I thank you uh, that you're speaking to her heart and that you are opening up, that you are taking something that has been called the heart of stone and you are making it a heart of flesh once again. And I thank you, Lord, that you are making and preparing the way already by your spirit for reconciliation to happen. We prophesy reconciliation into your life. Uh, Lord, I also, uh, Lord, I, I feel like there's, there's hearts right now that are, that are wounded um, to, to um, lost, lost children, um, children that have been lost through miscarriage and lost uh, prematurely in their life. And there's still like a wound. There's still a hurt. I, I, I even feel it. Just like even the mentioning of sons and daughters, it brings up this wound again. And Father, I pray right now that you're, we believe you're the healer. And that you just don't heal physical wounds, but you heal emotional and mental scars and wounds. And so, God, I ask, Lord, for any parent that has lost a child, uh, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would just minister and heal that hurt, Lord, that scar. Uh, Father, I ask right now by your Spirit uh, and by your power that you love, that they would just be baptized in a fresh baptism of love. And that peace would come to their hearts and mind once again. I thank you, Lord, that uh, that you can restore what we feel is lost. So this morning, Lord, restore, heal. Heal, Lord. I, I also uh, bind the attack of the enemy against your people. Uh, Lord, I, I thank you that some of the things that we go through are simply um, character development. Emotional things and things that you're, you're using in our life to set us up for blessing. But Lord, there are just sometimes it's the enemy. And Lord, I want to cancel the attack of the enemy right now in the spirit. I, uh, I come against and I rebuke every lie, every fiery dart, every weapon. That it, it, I declare that it shall not prosper. 
I speak over every person in the sound of my voice, both on live stream and here in this house, that if there has been, uh, how many know that when we talk about curses, I'm not literally just talking about uh, like a witch or a warlock, what they speak against you, but any time you devalue a person to another person, you are cursing them. I break every curse, every devaluation, every rumor, every lie that has been spoken against your people. I declare, Father, let it roll off of us like water off of a duck's back. Lord, I cancel the assignment of the en enemy. Everything that he meant to do with that weapon, I cancel it in the name of Jesus. I declare that it shall not prosper. That word prosper means it shall not go forth. It shall not accomplish what it was set forth to do. I declare that the word of the Lord shall prosper. I declare that the word of the Lord shall prosper. I declare that all effects of the enemy that are affecting the mind, that are affecting the body, be canceled in the name of Jesus. Devil, you will have no place in the body of Christ. You have no authority here. The blood speaks a better word. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, amen. Lord, I thank you that you're good and you love us and you've called us, destined, and purposed us for great things. We set our eyes upon the things that are above, Lord. Help us to fix our eyes on Jesus. We love you, God. We give you all the praise, all the glory, and all the honor, and everyone who loved the Lord said, Amen.